family separation impacts on men and women, especially impacts on children. I think a documentary of this sort starts to try and unravel some of the complexity, which means we can get a bit closer to even looking at how we could make things better. I don't think anyone gets married with a view to let's just end it if it doesn't work. There's no ways that I think that divorce and separation is ideal, but realistically that was never going to be a marriage that would have lasted anyway. The dream just became something that was never going to happen. People's lives change incredibly. No one expects that they're going to end up separated, but also nobody knows often the reality, the absolute brutal reality. And we are not coming to terms with that as a society. We're very accepting. Lots of people separate. You don't have to blame each other. This is how our modern world is. But actually, it's really, really tough. It's really important for people to realise the level of trauma and shock that they're in when they break up. Suddenly they feel like they're a second class citizen, suddenly they're losing friendships. There's a whole lot of things they never imagined might happen and we have to start dealing with that as a society. The kids were literally dropped on my doorstep in 2010 but I wasn't you know, in the position to sort of deal with all the emotion stuff, deal with the schooling stuff, the shopping, the, the cleaning. <laughs> I was battling really badly at the time emotionally and, and on many different levels. My ex-husband left the matrimonial home. I had been the family full-time carer. But within three months, I was forced to enter the workforce. And what began happening was that I needed to drop my role in the children's life. The most difficult aspect was accepting that the marriage and family that I created with much love and desire had ended. After the relationship broke down, I had no contact from his family whatsoever. They didn't call to check on the children or to offer any help. I have cut off all friendships and relationships with mutual friends and his family completely. It was a call one morning to say my grandson's in hospital and his, his mother's in a different hospital after a car accident. And he came to me from that day. When I left the actual relationship, it was tough. I just think we need to stop pretending that once we leave a relationship, it's finished, you know, all, all the worries have gone. And society needs to be supportive around the complexities of it. I'm unconvinced that we are paying enough attention to impacts on children. I mean, if you really understood things from a child's point of view, you'd come up with some different solutions, I think. The impact of the kids, it's on a spectrum, from worst to hardly any effect, but there's effect. They had the four boys living in my house, they're not seeing their mum. Three of them teenagers, they're putting fists through doors, they sort of you know, acting out in, in different ways. Um, I'm trying to work, run a house, um, you know, be there in, in the support for them as well. The impact on my daughter has been huge and it's been huge in a lot of different ways. She's actually in counselling. She has had school refusals. You know, as we're filming this, she's in bed. I can take her to see anyone at five o'clock at night and she's fine. Why isn't someone here at seven o'clock in the morning when I have to get her out of bed? That's the time that she needs help. When she's sitting in bed and she's crying her eyes out and just can't move. If family separates, we just think of the partners and the children, but actually the real reality is much, much more complex and much, much, much more messy. 
There's lots of grandparents in our society as primary carers for the children. Having grandchildren dropped on us, you're so caught up in the momentum of what's happening, how is it happening, and the, the court, and dealing with the changes, dealing with employment, dealing with Centrelink. It's very, very, very hard. I was at a point where I was really working very hard, long hours, to try and up my superannuation fund. He was 13 months old and initially I had to give up work because I could see no way out. First I was on New Start allowance and then it became part pension. Retirement, that's probably one of the biggest impacts. It's one that doesn't feature other people of my own age, not really connecting with parents of children that are at school. A lot of the focus now is with other grandparents or kinship carers that are in the same situation. There's usually a whole other emotional issue around what's happened to the, the parent, the mum or the dad. So not only is that grandparent dealing with a little child or children, they're also dealing with all of the emotional turmoil as to what's happened to their actual child. And that's a tough road. Initially I stayed at a church for a, 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 probably about a week or two. I then sort of stayed at apartments and things like that for a couple of weeks. And when it became quite apparent it wasn't going to be a, a sort of harmonious sort of separation, I rented a, a, a small, a really small place as well, but it was a furnished place. So at least I had some furniture and I could have the kids around and what have you. Um, it was then a case, well, no, that's not good enough. You can't have the kids around because they don't have their own beds and until you get adequate accommodation, you can't see the kids. We had a house together. Um, I was very mindful of investing in a long-term amicable relationship with him for the benefit of my children. I didn't pursue um, a property settlement. My sister helped me out and we moved into their one-bedroom granny flat. So I did that for three months while I looked for a property. I found a property. Um, their dad bought himself a house very quickly um, and so he was set up. So all this investment in no property settlement, no going for super, no, nothing like that. We go, you know, you take what you came with. Financially, absolutely disadvantaged myself. Uh, no doubt about that at all. So I found that quite hard. I was fortunate that uh, for the first three years the children and I remained in the family home and as I wasn't in a fixed full-time ongoing position uh, the day-to-day -day bills began accumulating. The house mortgage came to a standstill. I was barely managing food and clothing, medical costs and of course with legal proceedings beginning. And after three years of proceedings and a total cost of $300,000, I was forced to sell the family home, the one security that the children had. Once we decided to leave, my brother actually came and helped pack. And then my brother-in-law and my father actually came and picked up the furniture and moved it away. Then early 2012, we went into the local women's refuge and stayed there for a few months because we had heard that he was trying to contact us and the kids had said they didn't want any contact so we sort of stayed there for a couple of months and then we were offered the house that we're in now. Housing need after separation is an area where women especially are disadvantaged. Most primary carers are women, most single parent households are women in 2012, there were 780,000 single parent households in Australia that were led by women. So greater investment in lower cost housing is really crucial and we really need to get rid of a lot of the discriminatory attitudes in the rental market to one parent households. I sought free legal advice uh, about a year after uh, I was on my own. When I spoke to the lawyer, she said, um, this is ridiculous. He's earning three times what you're earning. You have the children most of the time. And 
I always paid more financially. I was always, you know, spreading myself thin. However, I can't do anything about that because this is about my kids. And if I tip, the, if I rock the boat about this, then the world falls apart for my kids. When I look at my financial situation, I don't have any capacity to increase my contribution above the, the standard for my super. I have no, I've had no capacity to build any sort of um, financial security for my, for my future. If you end up being the person who's the primary carer in the relationship, it will take you a long time to get back on your feet. If you've got young children, the economic implications are huge. It's a loss of your superannuation. You might go into part-time work, maybe lower paid, but that's what you have to take because you've got your caring responsibilities. Your capacity for career progressions, much less because you're part-time. All of those sorts of issues that impact on primary carers because you have that has to be your priority. In 2009 with the financial crisis I'd lost my job because you know I was under a huge amount of pressure. At the time the work I was doing the only work available was in Perth and Brisbane for me. So I was kind of weighing up well you know what do I do do I take the kids with me and, and just sort of make a move. But it was touch and go at the time, me not having a job, me being retrenched and it was all of those things trying to juggle at the same time. There were times where I thought it was so, so tough. Trying to work, trying to look after the kids, trying to deal off the emotional stuff, trying to get them to cooperate around the house. It was really, really tough. Uh, I mean, I, I would go to bed at after 12, I'd be up at 6. I only started working approximately six months ago. It's only part time. I don't think full time would work at all. Coming home at five o'clock and spending two or three hours with the children before they be go to bed wouldn't wouldn't be beneficial for them at all. At the very beginning, I had two jobs. I worked in a garden centre um, one day a week. I did night fill five to six nights a week. My sister would look after the girls. Uh, I think for four of those nights. And then one of my close girlfriends who lived on the other side of town had the girls on a Sunday night. That was really taxing for me, working until between midnight and two o'clock in the morning. And this all kind of, you know, marries up to not having an equal financial contribution across the two parents as well. So it's very much about picking up the slack. It feels like my life for the last 12 years is just, um, I'm always on a time limit. Everything's a time limit. I've always got to get here to get there, to get here to get there. After separation, employment is really problematic for primary carers. And once again, it's the women who are often the most disadvantaged. One year after separation, sadly, the brutal reality for women is that they, their income has dropped by about 42%. We really need governments to lead the way here. We need far more flexible work options. And absolutely, alongside that has to come accessible and affordable childcare. Centrelink, um, because I was already receiving some sort of benefit, that just increased. I was told if I didn't seek child support then they would cut me off, which they did. Once I put the initial claim in and they did the assessment, the um, payments were regularly every month. But then they're saying, well, he doesn't have to pay as much because he's spending more time with the children, but what he pays wouldn't feed them. There's no support with school fees, clothing, shoes, sports. Initially, it started off early in the separation where I was paying the mortgage, I was paying the car that you had, I was paying private school fees, I was paying some of the utility bills still, and then I would had to pay, you know, two and a half thousand in child support. And I said, I can't happen. Can't happen. I can't live. I, I just can't do it myself. Yeah, you know, the child support agency said, just stop paying those things and pay the child support. We had a formal arrangement with the child support agency, um, and that was all fine uh, for about probably a year to two years or so. And then he decided to quit his job. The practicality of that is quite interesting because what you can do in that situation is say, 
okay, I'll cease my payments, which he did. That was really hard for me financially because at this point in time, um, I had a mortgage. I was working three jobs. That put me under massive financial duress. The only avenue for me to dispute this was through a change of assessment process, which is a formal process through Child Support Agency. Understandably, they have to make it a fair and transparent process, but it's in triplicate. So he gets a copy, Child Support gets a copy, and I get a copy. So you're very exposed too. There's probably a lot of people that would avoid going through that sort of process only because they feel like then they're just handing their whole life over to their ex-partner. The policy framework it seems to me to be quite archaic. It seems to me that socially we've grown out of that model. Um, it's based on a one-size-fits-all approach. It's also based on the expectation that adults will meet their financial and emotional responsibilities to their kids. That's great. However, it's, it's not the reality anymore. There is a substantial arrears bill where a significant number of people who've left relationships, they're walking away from their responsibility. I don't know what it's going to take for our society to realise that there is way too much violence going on in private. It's across occupations, it's across classes, it's across geography, and it's not reducing. In fact, it's one of the few crimes that is actually on the increase. I chose to leave the marriage after having a knife put to my throat. A few days later, he walked in with another box of beer and I just thought, no. I need more for my kids. He just pulled me back by the hair and um, kicked me really hard in the backside and then smashed my head up against the wall and my daughter was in the room playing with a friend and I just thought it was always going to come to the day when he could not control himself in front of other people. After I left there was relief but there was also fear and there was disconnect. I remember thinking I didn't really fit anywhere where I ended up staying at my sister's house for two years. But he still had access to me and he still turned up at my sister's house and abused me. Even when I moved here two years later, I, st I still worried every time he came to the front door. When there's a power imbalance in a relationship and it's gotten to the point where it's become violent, the ability of the victim of that violence to make decisions about themselves is, is then limited. And they actually, in, in many cases, unfortunately, fear for what will happen to them or their children. The oldest daughter that I have, who was about six, I believe, when we first got together, she also suffered a lot of depression and anxiety and to this day still struggles because he was so manipulative and condescending and derogative towards her. The oldest has viewed mostly um, the abuse that went on um, for the first seven years of her life. My intention was only to protect the children from any further exposure to the anger and abuse that they've already been exposed. We know that family violence is one of the greatest contributors to family breakdown. We know it's on the rise. We've got to increase services considerably both from the prevention side and also with community education. If we look at how far we've come in this country in regard to our attitudes to drink driving, why can't we push for a far greater societal commitment to ending family violence? In, in 2010, the court finally gave me full custody. Uh, so, it, in, in effect, it was from 2005 to 2010, where five years of court hearings and not knowing. The uncertainty of that was very stressful. The courts didn't order him to do any counselling. All the counselling was directed at me, myself and the children. I tried to insist that he do the positive parenting course 
it was ignored. You can't sit there and say, but it's best for the children to have contact with both parents when they're seeing their mothers being abused, hearing the abuse. I entered the court system shortly after separation, at a time when I was most vulnerable. There wasn't a hearing at that point because the legal advice I had been given was that if we went to a trial, that I would risk less than 50-50. So for the fear of losing that time with the girls, I surrendered. That only was in place for 10 months because the eldest was showing signs of great distress. And so I took the case back to court and a full trial took place. And I really believed that I could seek justice and be heard. Intervention orders were in place. There were police reports. There was also an issue for a warrant to arrest. But the evidence of the domestic violence, they weren't given the seriousness that they deserved. I'm troubled by the fact that kids can be mandated by court systems to be having to live with someone on a shared cared basis when there's a history of violence. Because a marriage breaks up, it shouldn't theoretically then be something that has a rippling harmful effect. And I don't believe as a general rule that governments can wash their hands of this and say, well, it's all a question of individual responsibility. In terms of the emotional support network that I had, three really close girlfriends who helped me in different ways. The emotional support for me was, was absolutely fundamental. I've been to counsellors, I've got cousins that I speak to, sister. A lot of times families say, I didn't know it was happening, or I didn't know you felt like that. Getting it off your chest, sharing it, brings it into perspective. When I was going through that whole process, at times I felt quite a mess. I went and saw a psychologist. If you'd asked me eight years ago, do that sort of thing, never. And this guy, I must have spent, I don't know, probably about 10 sessions with him. He was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. There is a, a loss of self-esteem and, and self-confidence. Left to your own devices, that would, could easily manifest into something really negative. So my advice is to seek professional support and find the right person. It has to be someone that you can build a, a strong relationship with and connect with. Numerous research shows you that in moments of stress, your capacity to make good decisions is, is, is not good at all. It's not strong. So yeah, a, a, a deliberate, considered decision-making process is what you should do. The difficulty is when you charge that with emotion, it's not necessarily what will happen. Maybe making some smaller decisions that allow a bit more time. Rather than making one big decision, it's, it's making many decisions as they arise, I suppose. Yeah, when you enter this process, it's not who's right or who's wrong. This is a journey. What do you want now? What do you want in five? What do you want in 10 years? All right? And I wanted a relationship with my children. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the, um, whether I had five days a week or I had seven days a week. I wanted a meaningful relationship with my children and that's what I kind of focused on achieving. I would absolutely encourage anyone to remove any emotional element, to be absolutely practical about what you need to achieve, to write it down and to continue having those goals as well. So you need goals in short and long term time frames. Yes, they need to be achievable. You need to be reasonable about your expectations of yourself. I only learnt that from these circumstances. I went and got whatever resource I could to kind of um, help me. Because I realised the boys were, yeah, they were just being normal boys and teenagers. They were trying to sort of adapt to the whole situation and I needed skills to kind of deal with it. And at the time there was a course being run by Anglicare on dealing with you know, teenagers and you know, how to deal with them. So I went and did the course on dealing with teenagers. 
through my network, through Dad's link and Dad's in distress, uh, I found out that Family Relationships Australia was running a really good course for Dads, which is called the Pit Stop Program. So I went into the Pit Stop Program, which I found really good. It can be quite daunting, all of this stuff. My advice would be don't be afraid to go get out there and look at these organisations. Just don't try and deal with it yourself. I had her in with a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist had, naturally, as they do, prescribed antidepressants. I didn't want her to have that, but my doctor and the psychiatrist said, you know, we just need something to keep her even for about six months. It's now been over six months um, and the dose has been upped a little bit, but she seems to cope with them all right. And then the psychiatrist put her in touch with a mental health nurse who has been the absolute best thing ever. Due to the years of domestic violence, the local police became involved way back in those first um, three years of, of the marriage. On separating in 2007, they became involved again. And it was from the contact of the police that I became more aware of the support systems that were available. Protection, financial support, emotional support. Within the local magistrate's court, of course, they have counsellors, people that assist you in finding the right support. From there, I was put onto Berry Street. Well, Berry Street's an organisation where uh, there are psychologists and therapists that are able to assist you with therapy and counselling and for the children. They were able to actually guide me through part of the first um, proceedings at the family law level. And I must say that that was the pivotal point that I felt most supported at a level of law. The court system is not one to enter lightly. People need to think really carefully before heading down that track. Good idea to talk to counsellors, any services that are free of cost to really help you get your thinking straight before you take the decision to go into the path of using the courts. So lawyers in the family area need to appreciate how quickly people can become financially burdened. Surely it's possible to think about providing some flexible financial options for people to meet their costs in court that don't cause undue stress and financial hardship to them. The biggest impact has been financially. If I was going to do anything differently to all of it, I would seek financial counselling. We can make it a lot easier for kinship carers when they find themselves in the position of responsibilities with children. So we need greater support for organisations at the coal face and more helpful resources for people to digest at their own pace. When a child comes into your home at such short notice, you're in a funny headspace, but maybe we could be given a support worker that can help us through some of the issues just to help you through that difficult phase of, of getting settled in. I would like to see a kit. That would be the ideal, to give them a kit so that they can go home and say, oh, this looks good, this looks good, but you don't take all that information on board in the first month, maybe two months, maybe three months, because you're so caught up in all the activities surrounding them, health issues, clothes, bedding, you know, the change of your personal life. Being at work, one of the ladies there said, uh, I've got a friend who's in this situation and she is connected to a foundation called Mirabelle. So I became a member of Mirabelle and that's been the most wonderful organisation for him and for me. And through attending Mirabelle, you become connected to other organisations. For him, an organisation called CREATE for Children Out of Home Care, Grandparents Australia who have a kinship care component, Anglicare has a kinship care component and through that you don't feel so isolated. There are so many influencing factors in his life. I know I'm responsible for hopefully bringing up a child who's going to be well-rounded and be a good citizen, but he's raised by a village. 
The positive things are that he is a joy to have around. Uh, he's well rounded. It's not ideal that he is with me, but now that he is, it's all good. I've got to a point where I'm happy with who I am. Sure, I'm not happy with the external. I'd love more money and I you know, wish I didn't have the depression and all the rest of it. But even when I'm in bed and you know, I've got all these worries going on around my head, I'm still thinking I wouldn't be anywhere else. I see the bigger picture at the end. The children are going to grow up. They are, they are going to understand it's been an interesting journey, um, not one I would have willingly wanted to partake in. Um, I learnt a lot about myself um, through the process. And yeah, the, the foundations there, um, they, they know Dad will be, be, do their best for them. I never knew that I was as strong as I am. I never knew I was as capable as I am. I, if anyone asked me what word would sum me up as a person, I would say resilient. I would never have known that. I would never have known that I could have done what I've done. It took a little while to accept and understand and respect. I have a family unit. It's me and my two children. I wanted the children and I to live in a nurturing, loving and safe environment. And we have that.